Oh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I just came out here from Bangkok, which is only a five-hour flight. Um, but it's really nice because the weather is so cool here. Um, and in Thailand, we have two kinds of weather. It's basically hot or hotter. <laughs> um, and it's funny. It's, um, it's the only place I know where, like, when wintertime comes along, that's when the beer gardens open. Everybody's like, oh, it's finally okay to go outside again. Uh, <laughs> so just a really quick about me. As he mentioned, I used to be a Rails developer. I was a Rails guy for five, six years. I thought I was always going to do Ruby on Rails. Um, I built some really high-profile sites. I built Bloomberg.com, which is one of the biggest uh, financial news websites. Uh, I did Gucci. We ported that over to Ruby on Rails. Um, so I had a lot of experience. Um, about three, three and a half years ago, I, I started a, found up, a startup originally called Airplane, now called InfluxDB. And we were wrestling with a lot of problems doing coding on the JVM, and we needed some performance issues. So we, we moved to Go, and I haven't really looked back from Go for about the last three years. Um, sadly, I, I ended up leaving that startup because I had a really amazing opportunity with, uh, with Thomson Reuters. Uh, so basically, about three years ago, um, they came to me and they said, we have this instant messaging platform for stock traders. It's one of the largest in the world. But we have 200 developers, and we're spending $30 million a year. I was like, that seems like a bit much for an instant messenger. I don't think Google spends that much. And they're like, you think you could do it with us people? I said, maybe six people. And they're like, oh, wow. Um, so they gave me a team of six people and let me rebuild it. And um, we, we completely replaced their entire Java C++ infrastructure with Go. And that's what I wanted to talk about, because I think we're one of the older uh, Go applications outside of Google. We've been in production for two years now. We have over 300,000 users on our platform. Uh, so I just want to talk about all the pains. We've moved from like Go 1 to we're on Go 1.4 now. And I just want to talk about like a, a really large-scale application that's in production. Um, like he mentioned, I run the Golang Meetup in Bangkok. Uh, this is our mascot. We actually have the Muay Thai gopher. Uh, one of my graphic artists made us for us. Uh, we have just a small community, 30, 40 people. But if you guys are ever in Thailand, we love developers. We'll hang out, have some beers. I'll show you guys around. It, it's a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah, so like I was saying in our server, um, we have a very large Go server, 300,000 users. Uh, but what's kind of really unique about our team was we are originally in New York. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried to hire in a big city, but we could not find developers. So just out of uh, necessity, we hired all around the world. Uh, so we ended up building this project fully distributed. I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, how many he people here work on like a distributed team? Like you work here in Bangalore, and then you have a team in America or something? Oh my god, more than half the audience <laughs> works on distributed teams. So you guys all know the pains and the joys and stuff of that. So I, I want to touch on that and hear some, some thoughts from the audience also. Um, so just so you have a visual look, this is our web-based platform. Uh, we have a full stock trading platform for commodities, financials, and stuff. But we have a JavaScript-based front end for our instant messaging. Um, and this. The back end is completely in Go, and that's what we're going to. Right. So, so we have like a very sensitive, we have a very sensitive setup, more than most web apps. So a lot of web apps, they can go down, they can have problems. But instant messaging, if you crash, users lose messages, or they get disconnected from your servers, and they get very upset. Um, our customers are particularly sensitive because they're doing thousands and millions of dollars of deals on this platform. So when we have downtime, people are literally losing money every minute. So we have very, very angry customers whenever we have bugs. Uh, <laughs> so we, we have to be really good. Um, we're the largest financial instant messenger in Southeast Asia, Europe, and we're number two in, in the Americas. And um, how many people in here use Slack or HipChat? All right, almost the entire room, right? So you guys probably know about XMPP. Most of the servers on the market do XMPP. Um, w our server does a few protocols. Um, so we also support Microsoft SIP, which is probably the worst protocol you'll ever come into uh, terms with. Uh, somehow Microsoft thought it was a good idea to put instant messaging over a voice over IP protocol. Uh, but basically, every single bank on the planet uses Microsoft Instant Messaging. So if you want to talk with other banks, you need to, you need to be able to speak SIP. 
Um, like I said, so our team is uh, pretty much 80% remote. We have our core team in New York. Uh, we, have a couple we have a couple developers in Canada. We had one in Portugal. We used to have two in Germany. Uh, we have three now in Bangkok. Uh, our ops is in London and our QA is in Bangkok. So for a while there, we were spread across about seven different time zones during our development, <laughs> which, was, which, was always a lot of, which was always a lot of fun. Um, I just want to touch on this because I'm sure almost everybody in here is really good. But I think the number one thing when you're doing remote dev is you guys need to do video chats. Um, we do Google Hangouts, and we do them every single day for 15 minutes with the team. And I, I just think that having the visual contact with the, your team ends up binding people in different places together because most of my team, I only see them maybe two or three times a year in person. So I, I think that's kind of really the most important thing. Uh, really, the second most important thing is code reviews. How many people here do code reviews? Like, like more than half the time on more than half of your code? Okay, a few hands dropped. I mean, we still got about a quarter of the room. I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, a few years ago, you know, barely anybody in the room was talking about it. Uh, but we've seen a mi major jump in quality on that. So this is kind of the meat of my conversation, and this is where I want to go. So now having two years of Go in production, I want to kind of really talk about the meaty issues that we've ran into and kind of how we've, how we've dealt with them. Um, so if you hang on the mailing list, you would think that nobody could do development without generics and like, like every other post. But I'm like, there's like a, to me, there's a bunch of missing features that nobody ever talks about. Um, kind of a, the four or five big ones that we've seen is if you ever have to interact with XML, Go is a horrible language for XML parsing or dealing with XML in any manner. Um, the way we've gone around that is we end up using a C library called libxml2, and we end up doing a lot of work there. But then we run into a lot of Cgo issues. I won't talk about it too much because I know a lot of other talks have gone into all the problems with Cgo. Uh, the other thing is, if you guys have ever done regexes, like we have regexes that we do thousands of times a second. Um, the Go regex library just cannot handle that. So we use PCRE, which is Perl compatible regexes. It's about a thousand fold increase. So if you ever need to do regexes, you should, you should definitely look at um, using PCRE. And really the last thing is, is serialization. Because of the lack of generics, you end up doing a lot of reflection anytime you need to do, um, you need to do serialization. And you end up having some, you actually have some big performance hits to the garbage collector because we do a lot of in-memory caching, and this has kind of been one of our biggest sticking points. It's just being able to serialize and deserialize. We've, we've always been using the gob package, but we've recently moved to um, protocol, uh, Captain Proto, I believe. Right, so as garbage collection. I think there's been at least a dozen talks about garbage collection, so I won't talk too much, but I, I, I want to just touch on two we've really run into. Um, so for our app, being instant messaging, if you have latency, the users start to get really angry. So like if, you have a, if a message goes through a couple servers and you have a couple seconds of latency, that really ruins the experience. So like garbage collection performance is one of our number one key metrics. And we've noticed that depending on the heap size, the heap size is one of like the biggest indicators that your garbage collection is going to be slow. Um, so like we, we used to have 15 gig heap sizes for our Go processes, 10, 15 gig, and it just could not keep up. We've, we've cut our Go heap size down to about 500 megabytes, and the garbage collector's done much better. The other thing that we do, which is kind of insane that I don't know if everybody else needs to do, is every single commit that goes into our repo, we spawn an instance on Amazon, and we run a one-hour load test against it. If the garbage collection performance goes over a couple percent difference, we consider that a failed test, just like we would consider any other unit test a failure. Uh, because for us, performance is as critical as any other feature in our system. Um, so kind of the next area, pretty much every application, no matter what language you guys are doing, probably has run into I.O. performance. You know, you have a slow MySQL database, uh, you might have a slow network, these kinds of things. Um, for us, one of our biggest problems is we have a lot of stock traders log in at the same time. So when the Asian market opens at 8 a.m., we'll have 30,000 users log in literally within a three-minute window. So like our system really needs to be able to handle every, every user logging in pretty much at the same time. And kind of the approach we've taken is we kind of have this route. We have an interesting, we have like a, I call it a Russian doll approach. 
So essentially, we have our core server, which is called Nitro. And inside Nitro, we have this in-memory cache. And the in-memory cache is, if you can think of a CPU, you can kind of think of it as our L1 cache, where we keep about 500 megs of like cache data in memory. And that's like super fast. And then what we do next is we have four Redis instances on every blade that we run our server on. And these Redis instances store about 15 gigs of cache data. So we don't even hit the network whenever we need to get cache data. And basically, we have a ventral consistency on all the cache data in, in our Redis instances. Um, the kind of things we store in there are like roster list, buddies, conversations, message history, these kinds of really standard instant messaging concepts. Um, when that Redis kind of runs out, then we fall back to MySQL. But I would say that MySQL handles about less than 1% of all requests in our system. Uh, it's usually really pretty rare conditions that we ever go back to MySQL. The main reason is we usually just repopulate our Redis instances from MySQL in the background. So we're never hitting our databases directly. Um, kind of, we, we've kind of also broken out our I.O. into two different kinds of ways. We, 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 call, we say things are either permanent or they're ephemeral. So in, in instant messaging, permanent things are your roster list, your friends, what history you have. But there's tons of information that's ephemeral. So like, uh, what, what's my current presence? Where am I logged into? What server am I on? What's my routing information to that server? These kinds of things can go away and they can come back. And we kind of use Redis for that and we don't, we don't do any kind of disk storage. Um, how many people here are using Redis? Probably every single person in the room, right? Uh, how many people are doing consistent hashing with their Redis? Okay, cool. I was, I was expecting more, actually. Not many people raised their hand. Uh, and maybe that's just because you've heard it called something differently. But So let's say that you have an instance where you have you max out a Redis instance, because Redis only runs on a single core, right? And now we need to run about, uh, we have about 24 Redis instances right now, and we need to be able to divide data evenly across all of our Redises. There's a really simple technique. If you just Google for um, a, a, cons a consistent hash, you can basically evenly divide your data across all your Redis instances, and it will scale horizontally, and you can just spin up new Redis instances as your CPU load grows or the size of your, your memory grows. And it's super linear, and there's no raft, there's no zookeeper, there's no like coordination between your individual servers. So it, it really scales really well, and it's, there's no operational overhead. It's really cool. Uh, talked about this a little bit, the Seago issues. So many other talkers talked about this, so I'm not going to really talk too much. This is a big, this is a fun one. So a lot of people in the audience track Go libraries directly. So what we did for the first two years is we would, every check-in, we would grab the latest head of every single library that we used. But what was cool is we, our integration test suite was so good, we would find bugs in other people's third-party libraries as soon as they committed it to GitHub. I would have a pull request in five minutes of them making a commit. So, so that, that was really fun, but sometimes it was like a little bit risky and scary. So, uh, recently, we, we've started the freeze. I, I kind of wish that the community will come up with something a little bit better around this, though. Um, I want to just mention this. This is uh, tracking Go versions has probably been my favorite thing about using Go. How many people are like Python developers? Okay, we got oh, we've got a quarter of the room, and then we had half the room that was Ruby before. So, like, if you experienced like the Python two to Python three or even the Ruby, like, 187, somebody's shaking their head in there. <laughs> if you experience Ruby 187 to 193, you, you know, like, how painful it was. Go, every single, we've, every single time a new release comes out, we compile the same day, we switch our code, and within a week, we, it's in production. We've never once had an issue with the Go compiler messing up our production code, which has just been one of the best things I've ever had, actually. This, this is important. Who, do, who, do, here, who here does continuous delivery? Oh, wow. OK. How many people do continuous deployment? OK, we got like six hands on that one. So I'll just mention it really quick for anybody that doesn't know the difference. Continuous delivery is where you keep your master always perfect, where you could deploy to production at any point. And continuous deployment is if you're like Flickr, and like you just every time you, your test pass, you just go to production. Um, we can't really do that in the finance world. We're a little bit more hand-strung. Um, 
but this is, this is kind of one of our favorite things. I, I think this is kind of a major sticking point we found in Go is that there's no good integration test suites. So if you use like Django or you use Rails, they have like really kind of full featured integration pipelines uh, for doing tests of that scale. All the Go stuff is very about functional, like single like functions. And kind of what we've done in our test suite is we actually spawn a cluster of our instant messaging servers. We spawn Redis, we spawn MySQL, we spawn etcd, Elasticsearch, we pre-populate data onto all of them, and then we run bots using our public interfaces to our cluster. And that's how we run integration tests. Um, I kind of wish that there was a little bit more tooling around this, but like this has kind of saved us pretty much continually. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk about this. So, so we all know that Go only does static linking. There's no dynamic linking in Go. Uh, but we needed to have plugins because we have, we have different people. We want to deploy on different cycles. Um, and the way we found the best way to do plugins in Go is to use TCP. And what we do is we, when we build a plugin, we have it use TCP to connect back into our main process. So I'll kind of show you a quick diagram. So we have some, we have some plugins that run in the same process as, as our server. Sometimes we'll have processes that run on the same server, on the same box. And then sometimes we'll move them onto their own servers as they need more performance. But the code doesn't change because it's like, it just uses TCP, so it doesn't really matter where the box is. And it kind of really gives a nice scaling strategy and you can deploy things independently. Um, I think that was a really kind of fun thing that we did that I really like. Uh, metrics, there was a guy that, who did a whole talk on this, but I want to just do one really quick. Who, who has a metrics dashboard that they look at like on a television screen? Oh, there's about six, only six people, I would think more. So this is the number one thing that we have is our ops team has two 40 inch monitors at their desks. And at any point in time, they can turn their head and they can see the full state of the system. And from my mind, you need to boil your system down to about 10 key metrics. And any system should be able to be described in 10 metrics. Uh, we have one other cool thing. We track where, what region of the world people are logged into because we're very sensitive to stock market time, so we have to be very sensitive to when we do maintenance to things. But this, is, this has kind of really saved me a lot. I can just turn my head and I can always know, oh, my server's working, everything looks good. Or when we first launched, there was days where, oh, everything looks really horrible all day. I'm sad. <laughs> um, single points, I'm just gonna skip past all this because I just don't have enough time. Um, all right, so let's answer the Q&A because we have, just have a couple minutes here. <laughs> 